First Chronicles 27, beginning at verse number 25 through verse number 34. Just bear with me a little bit here today. I had literally probably 18 pages worth of stuff. My wife said, being the nice first lady she is, she said, commit. So I think we're down to eight. Amen. I believe that God has eight pages, not ten minutes. First Chronicles 27, verse 25. The Bible says, and over the king's treasures was, and there's a lot of names I'm probably just going to skip for the length of me trying to pronounce it, the Azmaveth, the son of Peniel, and over the storehouses and the fields and the cities and the villages and the castles was Jonathan, the son of Uzziah. And over them that did the work of the field for tillage of the ground was Ezra, the son of Chilo. Over the vineyards was Shimei, the Rathmanite. Over the increase of the vineyards for the wine cellars was Zabdi, the Shimei. Over the olive trees and the sycamore trees that were in the low plains was the Helian, whatever, the Gedurite. And over the cellar of oil was Joash. And over the herds that fed in Sharon was a Shitrei, and the Sharonite. And over the herds that were in the valleys was Shaphat, the son of Abnei. The camels was Obil, the Ishmaelite, over the asses was Jedi, or whatever, the Menachite. The flocks was Jesus, the Hagarite, the rulers of the substance, which was King David's. Also Jonathan, David's uncle, was a counselor, a wise man, and a scribe, and Jehiel, the son of Hakmani, was one of the king's sons. Ahithophel was the king's counselor. Hushai, the archive, was the king's companion. And after Ahithophel was Jehoiada, the son of Benaiah, and Abiathar, the general of the king's army, was Joab. I want to pull a thought out of the last part of verse number 28. You think maybe this is just a whole lot of names and a whole lot of jobs. But I want to pull out the very last sentence fragment of verse 28. And over the cellars of oil was Joash. I want to minister this morning and this afternoon on this thought. The keepers of the oil. The keepers of the oil. Would you put your Bibles down and would you lift your hands one more time in this place. We need you Jesus to be here right now. I need you God to speak through me and to speak clearly. God I want your words to come across. I want you to bless. I want you to challenge us and encourage us here today. We come against every distraction in the name of Jesus. Every foul of the air that would try to pluck up the seed. Every the, the thorns that would try to scorch it and choke it. The dry ground that won't even let the seed begin to be buried and bring forth fruit. God we command good ground right now. Anoint my lips to speak. God let me hear clearly and plainly from your throne today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Would you give the Lord a big hand clap of praise in this house. Hallelujah. Come on let's give him a big hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Day after day, bloody and 
battle had scarred. But now the wars are over. In our reading in 1 Chronicles 27, verses 25 through 34, and really for about four chapters or so in the book of 1 Chronicles, you will find that many years had passed from which their enemies had been totally destroyed. The scripture tells us that David subdued the Philistines. This is the first time in the history of the nation of Israel that they could say that the Philistines had ever been subdued. And that David had won victory over the Philistines. They smote the Moabites. They're no longer their enemy. The Syrians David fought against and they had conquered. The Edomites had been subdued and became David's servants. And the Bible says that David then reigned over all of Israel. David had conquered the world that was around him. But now David is getting older in his years and his strength isn't what, his, what it used to be. His fighting days are past him. They're no longer there. He, he's not the man of his youth anymore. He's not the man that could go out and kill giants anymore. In fact, it was, he was facing a giant not too many years before. And the Bible says that he was being overtaken by the giant. But some of his mighty men came and helped him and aided him in defeating the giant. And his men told him, they said, David, you can't come out to battle anymore because you're the light of Israel. You go back and you stay in the castle and we'll take care of the giants now. And then they, they, you taught us well, David. Now you go back and you know, you're not 20 years old anymore. You're not 30. You know, you're getting up there a little bit, David. So why don't you go and, and take your rest and let us start killing the giants. But David now is nearing the end of his reign and nearing the end of his life. While he's doing this, he begins to ponder and wanting to do something for God. David wants to honor God by building him a house, but God tells him that you're not going to build me a house because your hands are too bloody. You've been a man of war, and so you're not going to build me a house, but you will have a son, and your son is going to have peace, and he is going to build me a house. That son is going to be a man of rest. And you've gotten up every morning, David. You put on your armor. You've gone out to fight and kill, but your son will have peace. And he is going to build my house. Because of all the wars that Israel had been through, Israel didn't have any jobs for the soldiers. Their jobs were to go and fight. Their jobs were to go to the battle and kill the enemy. That's what they did day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. They were used to fighting every single day. They were used to waking up, pursuing the enemy, going over their spoils, camping out, making plans for the next battles, and then fighting some more. But now that peace had finally come to Israel, these men of war had nothing to do. They were sitting and they were idle. What were they going to do now that they were no battles to fight? How were they going to provide for their families? In our text, we find that David is starting to call out people that had served with him in the army and begin to give them new assignments. These warriors were lining up to see what was, what were they going to be rewarded with? What, what is my new job going to be? How am I going to serve the king going forward? They had spent their lives fighting. Now it's a time of being rewarded for their servants. It's a day of recompense. It's a day of reckoning. Time to get back what they deserve. Men are stepping into their place in the kingdom. And the awards banquet is just about pending. And each time, each of them, it was a wonder of amazement. It was a time of excitement. What will be my place? Where will I be? What will I do now that I don't have to fight anymore? Joash, no doubt, is one of these men and begins to wonder the same thing. What will I be doing going forward? Anticipation precedes the sleepless nights. Speculation begins to run high. I've waited and dreamed about this day, Joash might say, when the war is over and I become one of the king's men. How am I going to rank against my peers? How much authority am I going to be given? Will I be over thousands? Will I be over hundreds? Will I be over tens? Wives and children anticipate the changes in their lifestyle. Because maybe now we're going to move closer to the king. Maybe we're going to be the king's counselor. And we can move into the palace and be close to the king. Maybe we'll be the watchman on the wall. And we can move up into an elevated position. And maybe stay up there a little while. Maybe we'll be one of David's three chosen men. Maybe we'll be this. Maybe we'll be that. Maybe they're thinking, I'm going to have a new house, new clothes, new this, new that. But Joash begins to wonder, will I serve in the palace with the king, or will I be an advisor? Will I serve in the temple? Will I be a keeper of the gate that I will open every morning? Will I be a keeper that is on the walls that I'll patrol every single day?
single day? Will I be a keeper of the vineyards? Will I be over in his vineyards? A keeper of the flocks in charge of the king's sheep? Will I be asked to be the overseer of the king's treasure house? Will I be the one that goes in and wakes the king every morning? Will I be the one that dresses him every morning? Will I be that guy? What will be my place? How will I serve the king? What will be my rank? Will I be asked to be a judge over the affairs of men? But whatever it is the king has for me, Joe has to say it's going to be a promotion. We'll be moving into a castle. We'll have a new house. We'll have new furniture. We'll have a new place to live. Joe Ash arrives early that morning to see what his new child is going to be. He joins hundreds more old soldiers also waiting their assignment. The day begins in excitement as each name is called out. And as they call their name, they step forward to come before David and his servant. And they find out what their new job is going to be. Their appointment is going to be announced. And Joash is standing there waiting for his name to be called. As the day wears on, job after job is being filled. The jobs grow fewer and farther between. And Joash still has not heard his name called. At the winding down of the day, only a few jobs are left. Finally, the crier comes out. And with a loud voice says, Joash. Joash's heart begins to pound. His blood races through his veins. You've ever been at that nervous point? You know your knees are shaking. The butterflies are going. And you're wondering, what is going to be my job? What am I going to be doing? And Joash, you know that flush comes over. You get the cold sweats. And you begin, maybe I'm going to pass out. I don't know. But he begins to step forward to the crier before King David. And he begins to hear the voice call out, Joash. You are the keeper of the cellar of the oil. Joash is astonished because surely there must be a mistake. Is it really where I'm supposed to be going down to the cellar? I didn't even see that job listed. The crier, the servant reassured saying that, yes, that is what the king wants you to do. He doesn't want you on the wall. He doesn't want you in the flock, in the herd. He doesn't want you looking at all that stuff and keeping the game. But Joash, You've been given this special assignment to go down into the cellar. That is what the king wants for your life, is to go down to the cellar. Joash's heart almost stops beating, maybe. He feels faint. Sadness begins to creep in. He dreads going home to face his wife, telling her that we're not moving up. We're not moving on up to the east side. But they're going down to the cellar. We're not moving on the wall, but we're going to the cellar. We're not moving into the palace but we're going to the cellar. I'm not going to be the king's counselor. I'm not going to be the advisor. I'm not going to be a judge over this. I'm not going to be maintaining the treasury house. But, but David has called us to go down to the cellar. All of his hopes of being in a position of importance are gone. All of the, all of the thoughts of being in high esteem are gone. The high honors, all the things that he had in his mind of what he would be doing is now dashed into pieces. And he tells his wife, honey, we're not moving into that city. We're not moving up there, but we're moving down. We're not going upward. We're not going forward, but we're going backwards. We're going down into the cellar where the oil is. And you've got to understand a little bit about the cellar. And you'll understand why Joash wasn't that excited about going to the cellar. The cellar was the underground place. It was almost a city below the city. They had little little rooms and uh, uh, places where they stored the oil. And they would, after they would crush the oil from the olive trees, they would take it to the cellar. They would crush the oil down there and they would store everything down there. It runs under the city. The cellars are cold. They're damp. They're dark. They're dingy. They're lonely and they're musty. I remember as a young child, my, my, my grandparents had a, a house in New York, and I loved that house, and I've talked about it a few times, but there was one place I never wanted to go, and that was the cellar. Never wanted to go down to the cellar, because Grandma would call me and say, Nick, go down to the cellar and get canned peaches, or go down to the cellar and get the canned pears, and I'll tell you what, I'd rather jump off the roof into moving traffic than go down into that cellar. Because that cellar, when you open the door, that thing just kind of creaked open. That cellar just creaked open. And you look down there and it's dark and you hit the light switch and that one light bulb, you know what I'm talking about, that one light bulb way in the opposite corner of the room turns on, doesn't even light up the stairway. And I'm thinking, I've got to walk down these stairs. I've got to walk into that dark room. I've got to find the shelf that's got the canned peaches or the canned pears or whatever grandma asked for. And I've got to find my way back up. No. Not going to the cellar. Freddy Krueger 
Krueger lives in the cellar. If I go down there, Freddy Krueger is coming to slice my head off. And if you don't know Freddy Krueger, God bless you. Don't know. My dad was a, when, when he was alive, he loved the horror movies. So me being a tough guy, I wanted to be with my dad. I'd always watch him with him. Bad mistake. Amen. As a four or five year old kid, I'm like Jason and Freddy Krueger and all that stuff. But I'm thinking Freddy Krueger's down there going to slice me. There's a, somebody down there who's going to chop me up. Somebody's going to take me. I don't want to go down to that cellar. And my grandma's nice as she can be, but she'd say, go down to that cellar and you go get me what I want. And so I go down to that cellar with each step and anticipation of the murder that was about to transpire. I'd have to give my grandma a hug and give my mom a hug just in case I never came back out of that cellar. I want you to know, Mom, that I love you. And I want you to know that I'll always be with you. If I don't make it back up, Mom, you know I'll die and I'm buried somewhere in the cellar. Because, you know, cellar is where all the dead bodies go. That's where all the skeletons are. So you start walking down the cellar and it hits you. Spider webs right in your face. And not just spider webs, I'm talking spider webs that are spun by the most gigantic spiders that you have ever seen in your life. Ones that are bigger than your face. They're just, that's what lives in the cellar. Those kind of spiders, those kind of bugs. I go down to the cellar and spider webs hit me in the face. And it's dark and it's cold and it creaked and it was dusty and it was dirty. And I tell you what, time seemed to slow down in that cellar. Feel like you're down there for hours and you come back up and 30 seconds had passed. But I'll tell you what, it was the longest 30 seconds of my life going down into the cellar. Spider webs were down there. It was dark. Murderers were down there. It was a place that you may not ever come out of. That's the cellar that I think of. It's not a great place to be in. I can imagine that cellar that Joash was going to, as be the overseer, was kind of the same way. In that cellar, it was cold. In that cellar, it was damp. It was dingy. It stunk. Feeling like murderers were right around the corner. Somebody was going to take him. Spider webs everywhere. Because nobody goes down to the cellar. Nobody likes going down to the cellar. Nobody visits the cellar. You don't get up one day and say, man, I'm going to visit the guy that's in the cellar. You don't do that. If you fear for your life, you don't go down. You don't say, I'm going to visit that man that's in the cellar. Nobody does that. So Joash realizes that he is going to a place of isolation, maybe. He's going to a place that's going to be dark. While everybody else is up above him having a party, and he can hear the city in hustle and bustle, and he can hear people trading commodities of this and that. Joash isn't up there. He's not up there where the children are playing, and up there where the children are going to school. Joash isn't up there. Joash sometimes doesn't even realize what the hour because there's no sundial down there that can tell him when it's time to take a lunch break. There's no sundial down there that can tell him when it's quitting time. He realizes I'm not moving up, but I'm moving down. I'm moving into isolation. I'm moving down to a cold and a dark and a dingy place. I'm moving down there where nobody is going to come and visit me. I'm going down there and I'm going to be by myself. The cellar is the lowest rank that you could get. When a team is in the cellar, we say that they're in the baby that's as low as you can go. That team just stinks. So they're in the cellar. There's no hope for them. They're at the bottom. It means they're the worst team of all. Hey man, when you get into the cellar, you've gone as low as you can go. You can't get any lower than being in the cellar. And it's dark and it's lonely in the cellar where the light of day never penetrates. It's always midnight in the cellar. There's miles of underground chambers where one always had to carry a light, a wax candle, or a lamp filled with oil. Upon the streets of Jerusalem, it's business as usual. Everybody else is going about their business. Women are going about buying and selling, talking and laughing. Children are playing games. Everyone is enjoying their new status in life. But in the cellar, Joash isn't. He's not happy about his position. He's not happy about where he is. But in fact, he's down there. He's feeling forgotten. He's feeling insignificant. And he's feeling about all the opportunities, maybe, that I might have missed. Hey, man, he's thinking, I wonder what so-and-so's doing. I wonder what they're doing. I wonder what their family is. They're probably so proud of that man that he got promoted. Probably so proud of what they have become. But I'm just here in the cellar. I am here by myself. The keeper of the wall, they're walking upon the wall. They're calling to those below. Ahijah, the keeper of the treasure, he's in there like Scrooge McDuck, and he's swimming in the king's treasury, and he's counting all the money for the king. What a great job that he has. Ezri, the keeper of the fields, he's out there in the sun, and the wind is hitting them, and he's probably looking all tan and cute, and he's looking 
at the grave. In the high job, he's the keeper of the flocks and the herds. And he's up there making sure that the sheep are sheared and the cows are getting milked. And Jonathan, he's one of the king's counselors. And there he's in the presence of the king. He's giving advice to the king. That's what Jonathan is doing. The judges are hearing, ruling on cases that are coming before them. Joab is the secretary of defense, giving orders to the troops. And then there's Joab. Nowhere to be found, not even visible. In fact, people are probably wondering, hey, everybody see Joash? Where's Joash? I tell you, Joash, Joash is the one that got stuck in the cell. But you have to think about what Joash was in charge of. Joash was not just in the cellar doing nothing. He was not just in the cellar minding his own business, but there was something in that cellar that he was in charge of. Think about this. He was the keeper of the oil. Day after day, Joash would go to the cellar and work on the oil. Day after day, he would check the temperature of the oil because if the temperature is not right in the oil, it becomes of not effect. You can't use it if it's not the right temperature. If it's not the right temperature, the color of the oil begins to change and you know it's no good. And so Joash would have to go down there and monitor the temperature of the oil because it had to be stored right for the time that it was to be used. They couldn't go back and say, well, that one's no good and that one's no good. Joash had to make sure that when the time of the oil was needed, that it was there and it was correct. It was the right temperature. He would check the seals on the drums of oil to make sure that it wasn't leaking and the oil was staying pure. It needed to be unaltered by the elements that was around it. The oil was precious. The oil was costly and expensive. It was used to keep the lamps going in the temple. Leviticus 24 verses 1 through 2 says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. It's the keeper of the oil that keeps the lamps burning in the temple. It's the keeper of the oil that ensures that the fire never goes out in the temple. Let me tell you, you may feel like you aren't doing anything significant, but the keepers of the oil are the ones that are keeping the fire burning in the temple. Those who are praying and those who are fasting behind the scenes, they are the ones that are keeping the fire burning in the church. They are the ones, amen, that are keeping the atmosphere right in the church so miracles, signs, and wonders can take place. Thank God for people that are fasting weekly and fasting consistently and they're keeping the fire burning. Amen. You may not feel like you have a glamorous job, but I'm telling you it's your prayers and it's your fasting that is keeping the fire going in this house. It is your sacrifice that is creating an atmosphere where people can be saved and people can be delivered and people can be set. It's the keepers of the oil that are set in the atmosphere of what goes on in the temple. Because the fire was to never be burning. And the fire was to never go out. The oil was used for anointing the instruments. The oil was used to anoint kings. The oil was used to anoint the singers. The oil was used to anoint the priests. The oil was precious to the Israelites. You couldn't minister without the oil. You couldn't become king without the oil. You couldn't usher in the presence of God without the oil. You couldn't worship without the oil. You can't see yokes destroyed without the oil. I mean, I come to tell the church today that we need the oil. We need some keepers of the oil. We need some people that are going to give their life to prayer and to fasting. We need some people that aren't going to be looking for the most glamorous positions and trying to get behind the pulpit. But what we need is some joy. Because we need the oil. Where does the oil come from? The oil came from the cellar. It came from the place where nobody wants to go. It came from the forgotten place. It comes from the place of isolation. It comes down in the cellar. Where everyone else is playing, you're protecting the oil. When everybody else is doing other things, you're down in the basement and you're keeping the oil. What we need in this day are more people that are keeping the oil. We cannot have church without prayer. We cannot have church without fasting. We cannot have an explosion of God's presence without the oil. We need people down in the cellar that are going to keep the fires. 
God on the wall didn't keep the oil. The God counseling King David didn't keep the oil. The God that was cleaning the sheep didn't clean, wasn't the one keeping the oil. He was the one that was Joash, the one that he went down to the oil. That was his job. He might have thought this is worthless. This is a terrible job, but he was the keeper of the oil. He was the one who was in charge of the oil. And Joash might be thinking this, I'll never, I'll never be the one that gets anointed. I'll never be the one to stand before the king and get anointed in this position. Psalm leader, Levi, whatever. I'm never going to be the one that it happens to. But Joash was the one who was in charge of that oil that would be anointing the Levites, anointing the singers, the oil that would fall, fall upon the porters and everyone else. And you might have thought, oh, this will never happen to me. I'll never get that feeling of having that anointing and that oil flow down my clothes. I'll never know what it's like to have that oil from the top of my head just cover me to the soles of my feet. Because when they anointed back then, they didn't just take oil and put it on your forehead, but they, they opened up the sucker. They had a horn of oil, and they poured it on top of them, and it consumed them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. And Joash was thinking, I'll never get that feeling. I'll never have that feeling. But Joash would go back to stacking the oil. He'd go back to producing the oil and testing the oil. He would stack the drums on top of each other and move them as needed. One gets too high, he'd move it, shift it over here. Maybe we get more room on this side, he'd move it from one spot to the next. He would get the oil out of the drums when the time came to have the oil come out. Let me tell you this, that while you are keeping the oil and stacking it and producing it, you cannot help but get the oil on you. You can't help but get the oil on you. The residue of the oil will splash on you. The residue will drip on you. When Joash would leave the cellar to go home, he would have oily hair. When Joash would leave the cellar to go home, his clothes would be oily. Whatever he would touch would get oil on it because he was handling the oil. He was the one that had to stir it and make sure the temperature. They didn't have a thermometer back then to gauge the temperature. He had to put his hand in there and say, how warm is it? Is it too hot or is it too cold? His hand was in the oil. Everything he touched would get oil on it. People would know when he left the cellar that who is that man? No, I know who he is. He's the keeper of the oil. He's the one that stirs the anointing. He's the one that keeps the fires burning in the temple. He's the one that makes sure that we have singers, not just singers, but anointed singers. He's the one that makes sure that we don't just have preachers, but we have anointed preachers. He is the one that is doing all the work in the dark and in the gloom and in the musty smell. He's doing the work that nobody else People would look at him and say, there's something about Joash. Hey, man, he's an oily man. Hallelujah. He's the keeper of the oil because it's all over him. It's on his face. It's on his clothes. It's on his hands. He was saturated in the oil. Let me tell you what. You will become saturated with the oil if you are keeping the oil. People will know that you're a prayer warrior because the oil will be all over you. It will be on everything that you touch. In everything that you pray, it'll be on your clothes, it'll be on your face, everywhere that you step, there's going to be an anointing residue because the anointing is flowing all over you. Come on, can we give God some praise in this house? I come to tell somebody, don't be discouraged in the cellar. Don't be discouraged being a prayer warrior. Don't be discouraged that you're not behind the pulpit or you're not singing or you're not doing that. I come to tell you, probably the most important job in the kingdom was Joash's job. Get the oil right. Get the prayer right. Get the temperature right. And everything else will take care of itself. Because the Bible says, whatever you do in secret, God is what? Rewards you openly. Joash is worried, I'm never going to make a difference. I'm never going to be doing I'm never going to be known for anything. But Joash, you don't understand all those hours you're going to sell. All those hours you're by yourself. All those hours you're not up on the wall. You're down there making the oil. You're down there crushing it. And you're getting it pure. And you're getting it holy. So we can't have church. So we can't have the lights on. So we can't have the fire burning. So people, when they come and get prayed for, they're going to be healed. Why? Because the anointing's there. People that come in with infirmity, they can leave delivered. Why? Because it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. We don't need as many people behind the pulpit per se. But what we need are some keepers of the oil that are going to pray. It's the anointing that destroys you. It's the anointing we can't 
do it. But it takes prayer and it takes fasting. God might call you to say, hey, you're not going to preach right now. You're not going to be used like this right now. But I'm calling you to the cell. Hey, man, don't look at that position and say, man, I wish I was doing something else. No, embrace the position that God has called you to. Embrace the calling. Embrace the time of prayer. Embrace the time of fasting. Because we need the oil in the church to be fun. It was the oil that Joash prepared that helped purchase some things for the temple. Solomon was looking to buy cedar and lumber and all this stuff. And Solomon said, well, I'm gonna, I want all this stuff. And I forgot who it was from, but he said, no, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do is you give me the lumber and I'll give you just so many gallons of oil. The Bible of the Goodwins, what's in the Bible is 180,000 gallons of oil. Solomon says, I'm going to give you 180,000 gallons of oil. But can you imagine Joash, if he's not a keeper of the cellar, let's say he just gets, let's say he just gets tired. Let's say he just gets frustrated being in the cellar. He decides to take a few days off. Let's say he just decides, you know what, it's not that important today. I'm not feeling up to the task. I don't feel like praying today. I don't feel like doing this. And all of a sudden the king comes and says, hey, I need 180,000 gallons of oil. The Bible says that Joash had that supper ready. He had the gallons in reserve. He was working when nobody else maybe thought he was working. People might have thought he was slacking off, but he was busy working in the cellar. He was busy keeping the cellar. He was busy making sure that everything was right. Because if Joash took a day off, hey man, there wouldn't have been enough oil for the temple. The lamps could have gone out. There might not have been enough oil to anoint the next king. There might not have been enough oil, hey man, for the praise singers and the musical instruments. There might not have been enough oil to purchase this or to do that. Hey man, I come to tell you, there is no taking days off if you're a keeper of a cellar. We need to pray daily. We need to fast consistently because you never know when God's going to call upon you to produce the anointing. And I don't want to come to the king and say, well, I didn't think that was important enough. I didn't think it was significant enough to worry about it. Hey Amen. We have got to be keepers of the cellar. Don't worry about what Abijah's doing. Don't worry about what Jonathan's doing. He's giving things to the king, but I'll tell you what Jonathan's doing. Amen. He needs the anointing to give the direction to the king. Amen. Before they would do certain things, they would anoint themselves when they would go into the house of God. If Jonathan was going to give good counsel to the king, he had to be anointed. That means, Joash, you've got to be in the cellar, and you've got to be praying. You've got to. He may, Jonathan may not even thank you for it, and he may not even consider you, but I'll tell you what, what you are doing, Joash, is vital to the kingdom of God. For Jonathan to get good godly wisdom, he had to be anointed. And the anointing flows from the cellar. It flows from the basement. It flows from the place of isolation. It flows from that cellar place. And we need to be the king of the cellar. The Bible says that the first shall be last. And the last shall be first. Joash is thinking I'm done for. This is dumb. This is going to be a waste of time. I should be. A third, I should be over thousands. Don't you know the gift, David, that I have? Don't you know how important I am? Don't you know how many people I killed? Don't you know that I am well suited for a different position? Don't you know, David? David, the king said, no, your position is where I told you to go. Your position is in the cellar. Joe, I you're selling yourself short. Amen. Because that position here, you may think it's more important than yours, but it's not. There's something to be said about being sent down. We've got to trust the king to put us in the position where it wants us. The Bible says that he gives us hands and feet. We're all part of the body. And the Bible says that he puts you in the body as it pleases you. Here. He puts you in the body where he wants you. And don't you dare come back to the king or come back to the head of the body and say, I don't belong here. I belong over here. You're wasting my talent. You're wasting my ability. You're not helping me. No. You don't talk back to the king that way. The king puts you there for a reason. And if he puts you there, you're going to thrive in that position. But you're going to thrive in that environment. Don't question the king where he puts you. But wherever he puts you, you just say, God, I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve. We've got people here, all they do is clean the church. Guess what? Where would we be without a clean church? Where would we be without a clean church? Hey, man, we've got more junk, more mice running around, rappers everywhere, dust everywhere. But thank God, yesterday I was here, Friday I was here. Hey, man, and I, I was here getting ready to go out to work, and I hear a vacuum running, and, and somebody's singing. Sister Ebright's here, and she's vacuumed in the pews. Hey, man, it doesn't seem like much. What, what a wasted talent. What a waste of this. No, serve in the capacity that God gives you. Serve in that place. Honor him in that place. Because you don't know how important you are. You don't know what that does to somebody when they come in and they have a clean church and it smells nice and everything is put together in an order. Don't neglect it. It's so important. God puts us there to 
Would you stand with me here today? I'm trying to whip past this as fast as I can, but I want to. I think that we've had to whip past things, but listen. So as we've got to be a keeper of the oil. You've got to be a keeper. We have so many people striving to get behind a pulpit and preach, striving to get behind a microphone and sing. But God has placed you in the body as a priest. God is wanting to use you in such a great way, but I feel that some of us have just pulled the reins back a little bit and said, I'm not going to do that. I'm destined for more than that. Listen, there might be a time of advancement down the road, but if you can't serve in little things, how can you trust you with the big things? Joash, Joash feels like, you know what, I've done so much for you, David. You just turned your back. David said, no. It's because of what you did in that that I trust you enough with the oil. It's because of what you did in battle, because of your faithfulness to be in battle, I trust you with the oil. That thing that is the most precious commodity, the thing that they would anoint the Ark of the Covenant with, the thing that they would anoint the temple with, the thing that kept the lamps on, the thing that they would use for ministry, the things they would purchase, that, that oil was so precious and costly. And Joe said, I don't care what was on the king's treasury. I mean, you could do that job, Josh. You probably could. And you do a great job at it. You could be on the wall looking out for enemies and declaring people to come to the gate. Josh, you could do that. And you'd probably be great at it. But I've got a special job for you. And that job is to go down in the cellar. And that job is to pray. And that job is to fast. The job is to clean. To make sure the temperature's right. Because the church... We say, well, rise and fall in leadership, which is true. But the pastor and the leadership, and I'm not saying this is in our church, but don't, don't take it the wrong way. I'm not trying to say this, but listen. The pastors and leadership can be on fire, but if the saints aren't helping keep the oil, it doesn't matter what the pastor does, it doesn't matter what the song leader does, it doesn't matter what the ministry does. Everybody has a position in the body of Christ. Everybody has a position in the body of Christ. So Brother Spike talked about this morning, coming to that dinner. You have a position. I have a position. But don't wish you were somewhere else. Don't wish you were doing something else. Don't overlook the valuable job that God has given for you. So many people want the spotlight. So many people want that recognition of, look at what I have done. Look at, the, look at what I kept out of the wall. Look at the money that I found. Look at the sheep that I've sheared. Look at this that I have done. Look at how many people that I have killed. Joash, all he can say is, look at the oil that I've produced. I'm alone in the cellar. Nobody's, nobody's appreciative of me. I'll tell you what I love about this place. Is that we have some people in our church that are working behind the scenes constantly. Doing things, fixing things, opening things, closing things, cleaning things. Anytime I need them, I can call them and they're there to help. But we have great people. Joe ashes in our midst. But I feel like there's some that are waiting for more. But I'll tell you what happens if we don't keep the oil. The Bible mentions a parable of ten virgins. Five are wise, five are foolish. The Bible says they're waiting for the bridegroom to come back. Waiting for the bridegroom to come. And they're trimming their lamps and they're doing this. The Bible says the five that were foolish. What happened to them? Ran out of oil. They weren't keepers of the oil. They abused the oil. They misplaced the oil. They didn't take care of the oil. And they said, hey, you, you five that are wise, I want you to give me some of your oil. We can't, we can't give you any of my oil because then I'm going to misplace it. I'm, gonna, I'm not doing it right, so I've got to have enough for me to get there. Then why don't you go to the store and buy some? They go take off, they go buy some. While they're gone, that was as the bridegroom comes back. The ones that were keepers of the oil made it into the wedding. The ones that were the keepers of the oil got invited to the wedding party and got to sit in the presence of the bridegroom. Isn't that what we're trying to do here? Isn't that what we're trying to do? We're trying to make it to heaven. We're trying to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're trying to get to that supper, amen, where we can be there with our king that we love. The Bible says we're espoused unto one, and we need the oil flowing. We need to be keepers of the anointing. Do not misplace. Do not, do not misuse this anointing. Do not misuse or misplace the trust that God has put in you to keep this anointing. Don't say we can get by without it. No. No, we can't. We can't get by without the prayer. We can't get by without fasting. We can't get by without people that are working behind the scenes saying, God, we need you. God, we need revival. God, we need your presence. More than we've ever needed you before. We need you, God, to show up. We need you to heal. We need you to deliver. We need you to set free. People that are crying when nobody else can see them. God bless our pastor. Bless the leadership.
worship. Bless our song leaders and our singers. Bless those instruments, God. Bless those that are teaching Bible studies. Bless those that are cleaning the church. Bless those. We need people to be keepers. Keepers of gold. Would you lift your hands in this place? I hope I'm helping somebody. I hope I'm touching somebody. Would you lift your hands in this place? My God's calling each and every one of us to be keepers of the oil. He's calling each and every one of us to lay aside what we want for what the King wants. He's waiting for us to say, all right, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to what you have. I want to be in that place, God, if it's a cellar, if it's that dark place, if it's that scary place, God, I'm going to go there, but I'm going to preserve the anointing. I'm going to stand up for truth. I'm going to stand up for godliness. I'm going to stand up for holiness. People may overlook me and this may happen, but I am a keeper of the anointing. I've got to keep it pure. I've got to keep it uncontaminated. I've got to keep the mold out. I've got to keep the disease out of it. I've got to keep all the impurities. And so God, help me. Help my life to be free of impurities so I can keep the oil effectively. Help my mind to be free of impurities so I can keep the oil effectively. Help my lifestyle line up so I can keep the oil effectively and get out all the impurities. We talk about any time of life when we talk about this, we need anointing. We need the oil flowing. But the oil is symbolic of the Holy Ghost. We've got to be a protector of the Holy Ghost. We've got to defend Jesus. We have got to stand for truth and godliness. We've got to make sure that everything that we do is done. Come on, would you lift your hands? Is there anybody that wants to be a keeper of the oil? Is there anybody in this place that wants to be a keeper of the oil? Is there anybody in this house that says, you know what, I'm going to give my life to prayer? I'm going to come up to the altar and find a place to pray. I'm going to come up to the 